Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest LPL Market Signals. Jeff Bookbinder here, your host for this week, with my friend and colleague, Dr. Quincy Crosby. Quincy, I'm glad you're with us today because you are going to help us make sense of what's going on with the yen. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. Of course. Um, Standing invite. Standing invite. So it is uh, April 29th. Monday, April 29th, 2024, as we're recording this. Uh, I'll let you look at these lovely disclosures, and now let's go into the uh, agenda. So here's what we got. Best week for stocks last week since November. You know, it didn't feel like a great week on Thursday when we were down on the GDP report, but it ended up being a great week for stocks. Um, we're going to look under the hood of the, the data last week, mainly the GDP data, which really requires some uh, dissection, we'll call it. Um, to understand it. So we'll do that next. Then we'll talk the yen, followed by a little earnings recap or update. And then um, a look at the week ahead. It's a big week with the Fed and uh, the jobs report in addition to another barrage of earnings. I think it's the peak week of earnings in terms of number of companies Mm -hmm. with 175 S&P 500 companies reporting results this week. So, all right, a lot to get to. Um, So we'll start with just uh, last week. I mean, here's Here's the chart of the S&P. We just, you know, took a short trip down to under 5,000 and then right back up again um, in the 5,100 range now. It it looks like we're, a touch, as we're recording this anyway, a touch above uh, the 20-day and even the 50-day or right there. So this is a really pivotal spot from a technical perspective. And if we can hold above those levels, um, you know, clearly the uptrend will uh, remain in place. We were up about 2.7% last week to get us back to around 5,100. Now, at least as we're recording this, we're up a quarter point uh, on um, Monday afternoon. So here's the intramarket performance. Uh, the, um, I mean, it was clearly risk on and growth led. So you see the NASDAQ up over four while the S&P was up a little under three. And then you see the big growth sectors did really well. We had, you know, well-received results from Microsoft, uh, from Alphabet. Uh, NVIDIA didn't report earnings, but uh, they certainly liked all the AI hype last week. So we had a big week for tech. Um, And then in the end, you have growth coming back, storming back after the previous week, which was a a value-led week uh, when, when stocks were down. So we actually got back all that we lost the prior week, the week of April 19th, in just a few sessions. Um, so, um, any observations on the sector front, Quincy, or or anything on the regions last week that uh, jumped out at you? Well, yeah, I mean, it was interesting that financials were able to hold. And what we're looking for this week and next week is whether or not financials can continue to hold along with uh, the tech names and, and growth names. But what we're watching above all else is that on the days that we have a rally, what leads, just as you pointed out, is it going to be consumer staples? Is it going to be utilities? Or will it be the growth the growth names? Uh, the only thing that I'm looking at, though, to see if it could catch up are the transports. Uh, the trucks are not doing well. Rails are doing OK. But we always like to see the transports uh, enjoy a, 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 a market rally. That, that kind of makes you feel good about, about the economy. But um, nonetheless, you got the semiconductors coming back, and, and as you said, uh, across the board in terms of growth. That's what we want to see. Yeah, people like to look at the transports because it's kind of an economic barometer, but I think oh, you, yeah. say, you yeah. say the same thing about the chips. So, boy, if you look at the chips as an economic barometer, uh, this economy is doing uh, very, very well because we had yes. a great week uh, for chips and a great week for tech. Um, the uh, I guess the other point I'll make here, you know, international did fine. The dollar was down a bit last week, but um, you know, the Chinese tech names have been pretty strong recently. We we have a little bit of exposure in one of the portfolios that we run uh, to China as a trade. Um, so for real active traders, you know, China is so hated in, by U.S. investors generally, uh, and is so cheap that um, you know when those things start to move, they they can really move. So you see. Uh, you know, almost a 9% gain last week in Hong Kong, which is where uh, those uh, big China tech names trade. So that's uh, that's something to watch on the international front. 
we, from an asset allocation perspective, though, LPR, LPR research continues to underweight um, emerging markets. You know, turning to bonds, uh, commodities, and currencies, you know, bonds didn't do anything really last week, although high yield is equity sensitive. So it's no surprise that high yield bonds uh, generated some nice gains. The high yield bond index up 0.6%. Otherwise, um, at least through last week, you know, yields continue to rise as the market continues to price out uh, Fed rate hikes. Now we're at the point where we're not even pricing in, I'm sorry, cuts. We're not even pricing in two full cuts uh, at last check. So um, really quite a big move in Fed expectations. So it's natural that bonds would sell off a little bit uh, in that environment. Um, we had uh, oil bounce back a little bit last week. I mean, it's it's dizzying to follow the geopolitical head, head, headlines and try to make sense of oil. But at least today, the headlines, oil is down today, and the headlines are suggesting that maybe um, Israel and Hamas are getting closer to a ceasefire. We'll have to see. Um, maybe it's just the lack of bad news today or over the weekend, and the market's, you know, kind of getting comfortable with, um, you know, oil production outlook overseas. Uh, what do you think, Quincy? What What's the latest on the geopolitical front, and how does it? How does it relate to oil right now? Well, I do think it was the, the headlines of Blinken, Secretary of State Blinken, lobbying throughout the Middle East, um, you know, in Egypt now, and just uh, trying to get Israel and Hamas to come up with, with some kind of ceasefire. So that also, I mean, hit all prices um, as, as soon as the headlines look more optimistic. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely right. Uh, and there you see the, um, you know, the dollar and the currency uh, column here, the dollar down 0.3% last week. Uh, but really on the currency front, everybody wants to talk about the yen. So we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, all right, let's go to the GDP report. Uh, so this was last Thursday. Uh, the headline was soft, Quincy, you know, 1.6% versus expectations close to the two and a half. Uh, but if you look under the hood, it was actually a pretty good report. Can you explain? Well, absolutely. You know, normally first quarter GDP, the first read, um, there's seasonality associated with it. And we always talk about that. Uh, but what you saw was that exports didn't do well, but imports did very well. One of the explanations for the exports, by the way, is that uh, the US was not exporting um, armament. Um, and and be, simply because of the of the um, waiting for approval from uh, from Washington D.C., but nonetheless, also inventories, which you know you'll always talk about build up in inventories, helping um, the report. Well, we saw a, a slowing down of inventories. In fact, in fact, selling off of inventories that also brought the the number down. However, uh, we did see consumer spending holding up. Uh, although consumer savings is down, but overall, the expectations were that they probably, if it was a more normal report, you would add about another percent and a half to that 1.6 read, which is interesting, suggesting that when the revision comes, it will be higher. And by the way, statistically, a revision for a Q1 GDP typically is an upward revision. That said, by the time we get to the second read and then the third read on the first quarter, we will be so far looking ahead that it, it, it practically won't matter. But again, it was that combination, Jeff, of the 1.6 with the inflation report. That is what got the market worried because the inflation at the headline level was higher compared with a year ago. And if you have higher inflation, Weaker, uh, weaker economic backdrop. Suddenly, the headlines are screaming stagflation, and that's what got the market immediately nervous, or got the algorithms nervous, because it was an instantaneous reaction to the report. Upon further an analysis, the market did just what we did, and that is pull back, take a look at the components under that report. And then suddenly it didn't look as horrific and the whole stagflation argument uh, dissipated a bit, including, I want to mention this in terms of the inflation, 
we did not remember we look at headline we look at core we look at super core but also there were no surprises once we once we drilled down in that uh, inflation report the number was the same as in february indicating that inflation is not skyrocketing or leaping higher at this point so taken together the market absorbed it and we actually saw yields come down as a result of that yeah friday's rally on the core pce deflator was you know partly related to earnings because that was when we got the microsoft and the alphabet reactions but i think it was also just what you said quincy we were up 2.8 percent year over year on core pce deflator on thursday um and then we were the same that was for march we did the same in february yeah. uh, i think the market got more comfortable with the inflation trend after that but the the main point i'll show you an inflation slide in a second but the most important point from the GDP break, breakdown, and you you know you said it, Quincy. You you basically have, you know, more than a point of good news here that's been washed out essentially by trade and inventories. And so yes. when you look at just consumer spending, up two and a half, that's a pretty good number, short of expectations, but a pretty good number. And then you had capital investment, yes, pretty good number, up two point nine. Um, the uh, and then um, residential investment. Right, that's the top piece of this. For those of you watching, the kind of lighter gray shading residential investment that was um, almost a point by itself. Right, so we had a really strong. I mean, we've been talking about home builders, housing construction, favorable, low inventory of existing homes, and all of that. So the, there was, um, you know, a lot of good news here when you, um, you know, peel back the onion. So that's. Um, Good, good content there, Quincy. How about so on inflation? You mentioned Supercore, right? This this shows core services x housing, which I guess is pretty close to Supercore, right? Um, actually, I guess it is Supercore. So um, it's it's this area of inflation that's been the stickiest. Yes. Right? And if you look at the the light blue line here, which is core services x housing three months annualized. <clears throat> Right, that has really jumped. So, you know, I'll I'll start this off and then I'll hand it over to you by, by just saying, um, real time measures of rents, and we we've said this the past couple of months. It's just taken some time. Real time measures of rents are actually showing cooling, right? And so, once that makes its way into the economic data, inflation should come down. We're just having to be more patient than we thought we'd we'd have to be. So. Uh, that's a that's some good news. It's just maybe it's a green shoot. Uh, what else, Quincy? Can you tell our listeners to get them comfortable with this inflation picture? Because it looks like, you know, it looks like a spike, and it's you know the type of sharp move higher that's going to maybe take some time to uh, to reverse. Well, when we looked at the um, rents across the country, I, you know. It, it's varied, and and we look at rents, for example, in New York City. They're still quite high, and and it's where folks can't afford to buy anything. They've got to rent, and that's where landlords are able to keep the new leases actually remaining high, and we see that actually in the Midwest as well. So we need that. But what folks need to understand is that the way the Fed analyzes this, it is not what we paid for our condo or our home, it is what we can rent it out for. Um, it is the owner's equivalency rent, and it is about 33 plus uh, percent of the CPI, the consumer price index. So it has almost a disproportionate uh, effect on, on the trajectory of inflation. Other central banks don't use that. They don't, they don't figure that in, we do, and so, our job is to, as we always say, invest in trade with the data we have, not the one that we want. And that's how that's how we have to do it. We have to accept it. I have a feeling that uh, many of the, those at the Fed would, would like to change that, at least at the at the margin, change it and not have it as such an important um, have such an important effect on the trajectory of inflation. Yeah, it, you know, rents are long duration, right? Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, you don't. You can change the price of eggs faster than you can change an apartment lease, 
because uh, it just exactly. sits there, right? It just sits there for a year. So there's there's just a lag. But yeah, that's a good point about the uh, the the CPI too. I mean, the Fed obviously knows that that's yeah. It's a, it's, they're looking at a lot more than just that. But um, yes, that, that's the housing piece. We're also seeing weird stuff in in, in insurance. Um, oh. Right, rates for insurance and rates for actually financial services are yes. it seem to be um, doing some weird stuff. So, <clears throat> you know, it's been dangerous to say this is transitory, <laughs> right? This is temporary and it'll just wash out soon. Um, but that's still our view that we're going to start seeing lower inflation numbers soon. Um, we're just going to have to be patient. It's, it's just going to be a few more months. So, and frankly, I would argue that the stock market's been pretty resilient in the face of this, right? Oh. Right. I mean, if you've told me that the 10-year yield was going to rise 70 basis points this year and that the S&P 500 would still be up 7 8%, I, I would have thought you were crazy. Um, so, um, you know, that that sort of relationship between interest rates and equity valuations has broken apart a little bit. Um, so that's good news. So that's... Um, yeah, good discussion there. So next, this is from our weekly market commentary this week, by the way, which you can follow. You can find on LPL.com. Um, we took a quick look at sentiment at the end of this because, you know, it's it's natural to think, oh, my goodness, we just took two more rate cuts out after we had taken a couple out earlier in the year. You know, investors must be really depressed, right? That That's a, that's a natural thing. And we just got a 5.5% pullback in April. So it's natural to think, oh my goodness, you know, people must be really scared. Um, and we did, you know, get rid of some bulls and and add some bears during that sell-off. Uh, this is the um, AAII bull bear survey, the American Association of Individual Investors. Uh, it just crossed the neutral line for the first time since last November. So that means we have more bears than we have bulls. But this is still not a bearish sentiment reading. It's just slightly negative. So the point here isn't to say, oh my gosh, buy stocks because everybody's negative, right? The point is not to say no one else is left to sell. The, the point is just to say we've taken the froth out. This is not an overly bullish, overly optimistic uh, set of retail investor views. And, and this, this survey has been taken since the 80s. Um, actually, I can't remember when in the 80s, but it's been going on a long time. And, um, you know, has a pretty good track record of meaningful uh, signals. And so we'll keep watching this to see how how bearish it gets. But if it if it does get more bearish, we might be looking to add uh, add some equities. So um, next up is again, Quincy, and um, I'm hoping you can help me make sense of this. This is a really interesting situation because, the, you know, the end I, collapsed is too strong of a word, <laughs> maybe, but the yen sold off really hard overnight. And then rallied back. And the only explanation people can come up with is that the Japanese government or BOJ or both intervened. But I haven't seen anything to tell me that they did. <laughs> so how do you make sense of this for uh, for uh, investors? Because it looks like you know, it looks like Japan equities are holding up okay. The, the market's close today, but futures were holding up yeah. okay in the face of all this. Well, it was close. It is close today, or it was close today. It's uh, J Japan, but yes, um, it looks like an intervention. Um, remember the intervention, verbal intervention, the jawboning to the market to the speculators uh, comes from the finance ministry. Um, the Bank of Japan is the one that actually does the buying, by the way, and in what when they have to go out and buy. Um, and, and for the intervention. And very often, uh, if it's a big intervention, because we've had $60 billion interventions back in 2022, for example, uh, they will sell treasuries. They are the largest foreign hold holder of U.S. treasuries. So very often they will have to sell treasuries in order to raise, raise the cash to, for the intervention. But it looks like one. Remember what this is about. First of all, Japan does like to have a weaker yen. They are an exporting nation, but they don't want a collapsing yen. There's a difference between having a softer currency versus a, a currency that is collapsing. So they have they have you know kept the yen 
fairly fairly attractive for the their exporting uh, companies. However, what has happened is is what we call it, normal economics, the interest rate differential. It sounds so fancy, but all it means is that the central bank that is the more hawkish, meaning they're going to keep rates higher for longer. Yes, that's the United States Federal Reserve saying that. That pushes our currency higher vis-a-vis -vis the basket of currencies that we normally trade with or trade against. And Japan is in that basket. So the stronger U.S. dollar pushing, pushing down on the yen. And that is exacerbated a weaker yen. But in addition to that, the Bank of Japan, which I hope everyone on this call knows, they finally raised rates. Oh, yes, they did. But nothing compared with the rest of, say, the, the Eurozone or the United States. So that interest rate differential with a much stronger dollar, as the Fed has basically said, sorry about all those rate cuts we kind of promised, not, not going to happen. That made the dollar that much stronger. And any of the other currencies weaken as a result of that. The Bank of Japan did nothing to help the yen, nothing. In fact, they did the opposite. They became even more dovish about being accommodative. Uh, you know, don't worry, we're not going to raise rates. Maybe to the chagrin of the, of the finance ministry, but nonetheless, the yen just weakened and weakened. And then on top of that, they have speculators coming in, betting one direction or another. So it looks as if they did go in and intervene. We'll see if it's enough. But what will really help the Japanese yen is this, that their inflation climbs higher and the Bank of Japan comes out and said, well, we're, we're, thinking, we're thinking really hard about another rate, um, uh, rate hike. Remember, they are looking at inflation higher, not a cut. And that would help the yen gain strength. And then also what would help is if at this Fed meeting this week, the Fed doesn't sound as hawkish as the market actually thinks it's going to be between the statement and Chairman Powell's answers at the press conference. That would soften the dollar and that would then help ease pressure on the Japanese yen. So that, you know, I do want to point something out for everyone is that the central bankers and the finance ministries, including our Treasury Department, discuss this because they don't want currency markets, you know, destabil destabilizing. Is that a word, Jeff, destabilizing? Absolutely. They don't want that. So Chairman, uh, uh, head of the federal, my goodness, head of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, who used to be Fed chair, she has been in discussion with her counterparts, by the way, in South Korea, because they're also worried about their currency, but also obviously in Japan. And I'm sure the um, Europeans uh, or the various finance ministers in the in the eurozone also uh they like to say that the central banks don't have anything to do with it wink wink but nonetheless they try to make sure it doesn't catch the currencies off guard that are so important for stabilization so it looks as if actually the dollar eased a little bit uh the yen escalated just a little bit. We'll see how it goes for the rest of the week when the markets open up in, in Japan. Yeah, we certainly don't want them to sell a lot of treasuries here because they can. They can no, return. no, exactly, exactly. But, you know, the other side, if in fact they did need to sell treasuries, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. The more treasuries that they actually sell, uh, guess, you know, it is, it's difficult uh, for our markets. They are the largest foreign holder of U.S. Treasuries. And it, with all the debt that we have, we need our foreign buyers coming in. Oh, you said it. That is the uh, the understated <laughs> phrase of the of the day here. Boy, do we need that. We need those foreign buyers, no doubt. So, well, you know, at this point, our, our base case is that this will remain orderly and that yes. the end will stabilize, uh, not collapse. Uh, but uh, certainly if the Fed can get out of this really sticky place they're in right where yes. they have uh you know still strong growth and a little bit of an acceleration in inflation that, that they're trying to reverse if we can get out of that and start um hearing more dovish messages from the fed uh that will absolutely help japan oh, yeah absolutely so still like still like japan equities 
uh, relative to the international developed landscape. Um, but you know, you gotta maybe buckle your seatbelt <laughs> a little bit. Uh, so good discussion there, Quincy. Thanks for making sense of of all that. It is it is a complicated story with you know currencies being all relative. Um, I'm going to be quick on earnings, and then we'll preview the week ahead because it's it's a really interesting week uh, this week to talk about with the Fed and uh, and the jobs report. You know, the most important barometer uh, for me is just what happens to estimates, which is guidance, right? And on that score, this is a win. The S P 500 earnings have been revised up by about a half a percent since the start of April, right? That includes earnings season. It's after the first quarter wrapped up. Um, estimates usually are cut by a couple percent. So to go up a half a percent is is a big win. Actually, absolutely. So just based on that alone, um, this has been an excellent earnings season. But then when you look at the big tech names, um, you know, so far, I know people didn't like Meta's investment, right? Over investment, maybe some would say. But uh, the others that have reported, the numbers were excellent. Estimates have risen. Uh, so we're calling that a win. We still have um, Apple, Amazon, NVIDIA left, but um, so far, so good. I know Tesla sold off too, but um, I'm sorry, Tesla's numbers weren't that good, but they the shares rallied because of their plans for a low-cost vehicle. The, the, the numbers themselves, though, didn't look that great. So it, it hasn't been a, a win across the board for the Mag 7, um, but um, you know, overall, when you add all the numbers together, they looked good. So that's another win. Um, I don't know anything, Quincy, stand out to you in terms of uh, of sectors. I mean, I point out here that com services, energy, and financials have had the best revisions. I mean, you mentioned financials up front is you know performance have been pretty good. Um, estimates have been inching higher for financials too, which maybe some people haven't uh, noticed. So I think it was a good earnings season there. Anything else stand out to you? Well, one of the things that has stood out is the performance of utilities. You would think that utilities would not do well when rates are this high. So you've got to ask yourself, what what is it about utilities? And it could be that everything we, we hear, and we heard it, by the way, we heard it from Meta. I don't know if you remember Meta uh, in the conference call said, one of the things we're working on is we need more energy. You remember that? We need more electricity more, for- More power for AI. More power for AI. Well, that is across the board. And so uh, electrical grids are being uh, necessary for all of that. They've got to be upgraded. They've got, they've got to be able to handle all, all of the, de the, the demand. Maybe that is why utilities uh, have, has, been, has been actually doing well next to in concert with the growth names so maybe now it is becoming a a what shall i say the subcontractor for uh all of the uh ai work but but what was second derivative play yeah derivative yeah derivative play but what really did stand out and that's what we're going to pay attention for um for uh apple and for amazon is that from microsoft and also alphabet they they have started to monetize all of the all of the AI innovation, all of the expense associated with that. They were able to say, "This is what we we have. This is what we're doing, and it's going to continue." It, it was extremely helpful for a market that was desperate, absolutely desperate, for that kind of guidance. And as you, we're, we're going to hear ultimately for, for the from the company that provides all of the infrastructure for these companies, not until not until the 22nd of May, that it will be NVIDIA. Oh yeah, that's that's gonna be a big one, yeah. uh, no, no doubt. So yeah, that's an interesting theme. Need more power for AI and certainly some utilities are benefiting from that. Uh, so the week ahead, of course, it's, it's the Fed and its jobs. I think, you know, it's gonna be hard for the Fed to out hawk the bond market. Um, what are you looking for on the jobs report? Um, do you think, um, you know, is there the potential there for maybe some good news on the inflation front? What, what, what do you, what are people gonna, gonna see on Friday? Well, I mean, the the consensus estimates is still pretty good. I mean, we had just over three hundred thousand in the last one. So, what we're going to pay attention to? Are yep. we going to see a revision? 
from last month's report. Why am I mentioning that? Because we have seen a series of revisions downward. So that's going to be important because those folks who watch every nook and cranny of the labor market pay very close attention to that, wondering if that's some sort of signal suggesting that the cracks are there in the labor market. They just have not, they've, they've been slightly dormant. So they, they, they follow that. We're going to watch for that. Also, we're going to watch to see the hours worked. This is very important because many economists have been pointing out, you know, Quincy, this sounds great, 3.8% unemployment, but a lot of folks have been made part-time. They've cut back hours. We are going to see how hours work per week. What we really want to see is a full week of work because that tells you that the economy, the underpinning for this report is actually strong. You don't want to see the hours work pull back. Although, if you see it pull back, maybe it does help you think that perhaps inflation will subside. Nonetheless, that will be important. And again, we'll look for wages. This is crucial. And the reason is quite simple. Yes, it is very nice to see people earn more money, no doubt about it. But when the wages climb higher, companies that are paying those higher wages try to do what they always seem to try to do. And that is take the higher wage cost because it's an input cost and then pass it along with higher prices. And there you have inflation. So we want to see whether or not wages are climbing higher. The market really just want, doesn't want to see that. So we'll be paying attention to that. And also where the jobs are coming from. You know, which areas in the economy? Is it government? Is it uh, white collar workers? Because they tend to earn more. But we're also hearing that many companies are trimming those white collar workers because they tend to earn obviously more. They're on salary and bonus. So we we'll want to see if we're, if we're seeing that. Where is the work coming from? Or is it in the service sector? Speaking of, this week is important for one other reason. With the market and Fed that is so focused on inflation and the trajectory of inflation, we have the Institute for Supply and Management, ISM, manufacturing survey coming out this week, and also the service sector. This is what the market is going to zero in on. Prices paid, prices received. We know that they had climbed higher, but we did see another report coming from S&P Global where the prices came down. But the ISM Institute for Supply Management Purchasing Manager reports are very much followed by markets. And, and now, because of the focus on inflation by the Fed and by everyone who's become an economist uh, who focuses on the markets, that is going to be a headline if it is climbing higher, but also another headline if it is a downward trajectory of those prices. I can't stress that enough. I can't think of anybody who doesn't want to be an economist, Quincy. So we'll all try to <laughs> we'll all try to assess that ISM number on Wednesday uh, to see what it's. Thank you. Thank you very I, much. I like that. the ISM because it tells us what's happening with earnings. A little bit of a leading indicator of earnings. Oh, it is. It absolutely. So absolutely. So, yeah, it's not just jobs and Fed and earnings. It is also ISM. So thanks for that look ahead, Quincy. Let's go ahead and and, and wrap there. Thanks uh, as always for for joining. Thank you to all of our listeners. Uh, thank you for uh, listening to another edition of LPL Market Signals. We will be back with you next week. Looking forward to it. Take care, everybody.